at all you beautiful people. It is great to be here with you guys today. Thank you guys all so much for taking the time to come to TEDx Berkeley. And thanks to those of you who are watching online. I imagine that today will be a day that you'll remember. I know that I will. And I'm willing to bet that there will be some seeds that are planted here today that will grow into plants that will bear essential fruits and medicines for hum humanity and our planet. So water your TED seeds well. <coughs> Speaking of plants and the planet, can I get a show of hands for how many people in the audience have heard of biochar before? Cool, give a little wave. Hi, everyone. <coughs> now, biochar to me is a story of how I came to live into one of my favorite quotes of all time. Work is love made visible. This is really the most important thing there is to say. In fact, we could actually close the talk right now, but I do have about 16 minutes left, so I think I'm gonna keep going. <clears throat> Biochar is the story of how I came to live into this quote. You guys will all be able to accredit TEDx Berkeley with how you learned about biochar. Before I found biochar, I was a hopeless idealist with very little direction in my life. I had 30 jobs by the time I was 24. I started early and changed often to keep it fresh. And it wasn't until I found biochar that I really found something that connected my love for people and planet and brought it into meaningful work into the world. And the way I found biochar has to do with meditation, Burning Man, and a small, barely inhabited island off the coast of Lombok called Gilimeno, of course. <coughs> About Six years ago, I met a man at Burning Man, a good friend who is now my boss. He's right over there. And he started telling me about this thing called biochar. And it sort of at the time went in one ear and out the other. And fast forward six, about 18 months, and I'm sitting on an island in the South Pacific, uh, off of the coast of Lombok, just east of Bali, that middle island right there. And I'm on a short solo meditation retreat. <coughs> and I'm meditating there, and I've got ants crawling on me, and I'm trying to pretend that I'm that good of a meditator that I actually just don't even notice, right? So I'm sitting there sort of like, it's all one. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm meditating on interconnectivity, and, and I'm marveling at just how real it is that everything we do, every little action, ripples out into the fabric of reality that we all share and affects all of us in some way, big or small. And I'm thinking about that, just me and the ants. And <clears throat> I start thinking about this beautiful island that I'm sitting on. And it pops into my head that, you know, if climate change keeps going in the direction that it's going, Gili Meno is not going to be there in a few decades. And I thought, well, where do those people go? Whose culture do they get absorbed into? Whose political system? How do they feel when their home is underwater? And it was there that I realized very viscerally for the first time that Climate change is an interconnectivity issue. It is our planetary system sounding a loud alarm to wake up and smell the interconnectivity coffee. And I thought to myself, there's got to be some solution. There's got to be some way. We're an adaptable species. We must be able to figure this out. There's, there's got to be something in front of our nose that we're just not seeing. And I remembered something that I had learned in permaculture, which states that the solution is contained within the problem. Basically, if you look at the pieces of the puzzle that make up the problem, the pieces of the puzzle that make up the solution become self-evident. And so I thought to myself, well, what is the problem? The problem, very simply put, is that we're putting too much carbon in the atmosphere. Well, where are we getting the carbon? We're mining it from the ground uh, in the form of coal and other fossil fuels that we're using for our energy. I was like, well, that's pretty simple. We just have to put the carbon back. And I was like, oh wait, how do we do that? And, and then it was literally like a light went off in my head and the voice of God popped in there or something and was like, biochar. And I was like, whoa, how'd you get in there? And all the things that my friend from Burning Man had been telling me for the last 18 months started to sink back in into this one simple concept. We have to put the carbon back like good little kids with our toys and biochar is the way to do it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is biochar, how it's used, and why the heck should we all care. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard, bio what? In fact, I was telling uh, Walter, who just spoke before me, about that I work on biochar uh, before this. And he said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to speak English to me. <laughs> So dissecting the word biochar, biochar is basically just biological plus charcoal. Put them together, happy marriage, biochar. <coughs> biochar is charcoal that's added to soil, and when you add biochar to soil, it sequesters carbon for on the order of a thousand years. If you had asked me 10 years ago how much I care about pyrolysis, I would have at least given you a blank stare and possibly thrown my drink in your face. Now I care a lot about pyrolysis, because pyrolysis is how biochar comes into being, and biochar is what I have, for the time being, dedicated my life to. Pyrolysis is basically biomass plus heat minus oxygen, and you're left with a very stable form of carbon that's excellent for soils. And so where does all this biomass come from? I used to worry about this, and then I started to realize that I tend to be very disconnected from where my food comes from and where the things are that, that I use. And I thought about, you know, I, I buy canned peaches from the store, they have no pits, where do those pits go? Or how about the coconut shells from my coconut oil? Or the peanut shells from, from my peanut butter? Or the deluxe roasted salted mixed nuts? Mm. Or, or how about the wood chips from the, fire, the firewood that we buy? <coughs> and then I realized well, there's actually a lot of waste biomass available. So we can take this wa waste biomass and put it in a process that can be as simple as primitive stoves in the developing world, such as this one that this woman here in Haiti is using. A friend of mine, Nat, at World Stove is starting a biochar cook stove revolution in Haiti. Uh, or it can be made in simple things that you make in your backyard out of urban debris, such as this one that my friend Kelpie made in Oregon. And up to slightly more complex systems like this mobile processor that can be used to produce biochar for small farms and communities. Or this one, which processes chicken poo. This is actually the first time I've ever been moderately excited about chicken poo. Or this large industrial plant, which pro produces multiple energy co-products as well. This is also the first time that I've been moderately excited about large industrial plants. <coughs> And so you take this waste biomass, you put it in through any number of these processes, and you get a charcoal substance that you can then add to soil. Now, lest you think that I'm waltzing us down some primrose path of an unproven, untested technology, I'd like to tell you a little story. We're not the first ones to put biochar in the soil. <coughs> and though the bi biochar's modern use is relatively new, has been mostly research, and the industry that I'm trying to midwife is still pretty young and fledgling. Biochar actually has its roots in ancient Amazonian agricultural practices, where a brilliant group of entrepreneurs, about 7,000 years ago, would bury charcoal in the soil for, uh, for generations, rendering it so fertile to this day that people actually dig it up and sell it. They call these soils terra preta, which means dark earth. Amazonian soils are notoriously infertile. There's actually so much life that's drawing off of them that most of the nutrients are actually in the plants themselves and not in the soil. So it makes agriculture down there relatively difficult, but the ancient Amazonians found the secret to rich soils. And they're actually calling this the secret of El Dorado. Back in the 1500s, when uh, Spanish explorers went down into the Amazon, they came back and described finding these huge 100,000-person towns with beautiful, agriculturally engineered landscapes and log large causeways in between them. And explorers went back about uh, 40 years later, and they found diddly squat. Turns out they had been wiped out by smallpox. Uh, but even modern anthropologists dismissed it as myth because the uh, Amazonian soils are so notoriously infertile that there's no way they could have sustained that level of population. So they thought that the explorers had been just lying to impress people or perhaps had found some South American plant that they'd had some fun with. <coughs> it wasn't until the early 2000s that people started to make the connection between all the places that the explorers had described finding civilizations and all the places where this charcoal had been buried. So the practice of adding charcoal to the soils was able to sustain, make the environment able to sustain larger populations than ever thought possible. And this ancient wisdom is coming back to life via biochar. So we talked about what it is and where it comes from. How is it used? I use biochar in my houseplants. And this spring, I'm very excited. I'm going to put it in my front garden. It's very simple. You just incorporate it like compost. Biochar can also be used in small agriculture, community farms, urban gardening, 
or in industrial agriculture as well. But when I really started to get excited about biochar is when I came across some studies in the developing world. And this is a study, um, some experiments that were done in Cameroon in Africa by an organization called Biochar Fund that works mostly with women farmers. And there you can see this is biochar, this is no biochar. Happy farmers, happy bellies. They actually achieved biomass yield increases by up to 250% more than with no biochar. And one woman even said that their corn was so beautiful that people actually stole it. <laughs> and she was proud of this. <laughs> it was the first time that their corn had been beautiful enough to steal, and it was also the first time that they felt that they had enough so they could actually share. And this reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. Just, just improving the soil can improve lives in so much. Despite our artistic pretensions, sophistication, and many accomplishments, we owe our existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. It's so easy for us to go through our lives and our daily lives and all the trials and celebrations that we experience and all these lofty ideas and completely forget about what it is that actually makes all of this possible. That this six-inch layer of topsoil sustains seven billion people and all of their happiness and all of their sadness. And it was through my connection to biochar that I, and, and following the lines of what all it connects to that I started to actually appreciate the ground beneath my feet in a much better way. And we really need to appreciate the ground beneath our feet much more. It takes a thousand years to build one to two inches of topsoil. And it takes 30 to 40 years of modern agriculture to destroy it. And in fact, people have coined the term peak soil because we've actually destroyed 30% of arable land worldwide in the last 40 years. Fortunately, biochar offers one piece of the puzzle to the solution. Biochar builds soil structure. This is a picture of biochar under a microscope. You can see it's incredibly porous. One gram of biochar can have a surface area of up to 400 meters squared. It's basically like taking something the size of a basketball court and folding it up into something the size of a sugar cube. So this creates a home. Something, it's basically like a coral reef for soil, and it creates a home for microorganisms and mycorrhizal fungi to come in. They make their homes in these, in these little biochar apartments, and it'll stay there and build this structure for on the order of a thousand years. In addition, biochar also absorbs water like a sponge, and it holds on to nutrients like a magnet, preventing them from leaching off into the groundwater. All of this can lead to crop yield increases of 15 to 200 percent, depending on your original soil quality. Could this be the new green revolution? Maybe something that's actually green? I think biochar has a key role to play, and I'd like all of you to help me spread the meme. Now, going back to my meditation on the island, what does biochar really have to do with climate change? <coughs> Let's talk carbon cycles for a second. Let's pretend that I'm a tree. It's not hard, I'm about six feet tall. And I take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and I make my body with it. I grow big and strong, and then eventually I die. And <coughs> over the course of months or years, all the carbon that I made my body with goes back into the atmosphere. Or if I'm burned, it goes back immediately. Not good, don't burn plants. <laughs> now, that's the normal carbon cycle. Lather, rinse, repeat, this happens all the time. Biochar modifies this cycle, and basically, the plant takes the carbon out of the atmosphere. We take the, the plant when it's dead and going to rot or burn and put it through pyrolysis about half of the carbon ends up in biochar, where it will be sequestered for a very long time. The other half of the carbon can be used for energy, so it can offset fossil fuels. Put those together, voila, you have a climate change solution. And studies show that if this were globally deployed, it could actually offset 12% of human greenhouse gas emissions annually. We have a long way to go from here to there, but the potential is huge. Biochar basically takes the fossil carbon emission cycle, which takes carbon out of the ground, puts it up in the air, and flips it around and takes carbon out of the air through the help of our plant friends and puts it back into the ground. I once heard a climate scientist at the UN say that if carbon dioxide were purple, we would all be freaking out right now. 
But it's not. We can't touch carbon dioxide. We can't see it. But this carbon is black. <laughs> and you can touch it. And you can get your hands really quite dirty in it. And to put it very simply, if we don't put this into the ground, it's going up into the air, plain and simple. One ton of biochar is equal to the equivalent of about three tons of carbon dioxide, sequestered for on the order of a 1,000 years. When I originally started to prepare this talk, I spent a lot of time looking at statistics for all of the issues that you see up here, climate change, energy, soil fertility, food security, desertification. And you know what? I got really depressed. <laughs> and I remembered back to 10 years ago when I would hear all this bad news about climate change, and really all I felt that I could do was email my politicians, and then what? I felt sort of helpless beyond that. And I realized that that's not the story I want to tell to you guys today. I'll leave the bad news to NPR. I'd rather be a solutionary than a problem, pro problemarian. And biochar is a way that I started to be able to take my love and turn it into a piece of the puzzle for all solutions to all of these issues. And it made it more personal for me. I, I think about it like when I see someone in need asking me for money on the street and I have nothing to offer them, I tend to feel disconnected from who they are, from their humanness, from their situation. But when I have a solution, it, it makes me able to stand next to them for just a moment and say, hey, I feel you, and I'm part of your situation. We can work together on this. And biochar was what allowed me to be able to do this, and now you all have a piece of this puzzle as well. I'd like to leave you with this thought, which I think is very true. If we don't change course, we'll end up, we'll end up exactly where we're headed. If we want to change course, we have to start realizing that each of us, every single one of us, is a piece of the puzzle to the solution. And the way to get there is to start with what you love. What do you really love? Not what you think you should love, not what other people think you should love, but what do you actually, genuinely love? And then it's not enough to just feel that in your heart. The way the world is right now, we really need you to bring that out into the world. We need you to make it visible. And that's the real work. Thank you all for letting me come and share my love via my work with you today and show you my piece of the puzzle.